When the CrowdStrike incident happened, I was alarmed and notified of degrading performance in parts of our system. That's because we were indirectly impacted. I'm going to provide some thoughts around some of the resilience that we built to keep our system alive and online generally, as well as when an incident like this happens, some other things that I've been thinking about now. Before I jump into how I was impacted and some tips on resilience, I'd like to thank EventStore for sponsoring this video. EventStoreDB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So I mentioned indirectly, and that's because I'm not a CrowdStrike customer, so I wasn't directly affected, but I was indirectly because I leveraged third-party services that were unavailable because of this. So what happens is we are calling these third-party APIs over HTTP that are really integral to our part of our system, and they were failing or completely unavailable, or they were just really uh, unresponsive. So one of the resilience parts of our system is that any integral parts of uh, third-party services, we generally have a fallback. And that means when a request is made from a client to our API and we need to interact with this third-party service and it's unavailable, we have immediately a standby, that fallback that we interact with, that can get us generally good enough results. The reason I knew our system had degraded performance was because I was alarmed because of metrics and metrics around these fallbacks. So when we were making that API call to that third party service and it was failing, and then we were hitting our fall fallback, we had a metric for that, which ultimately we would alarm on in a window of when it was happening too often. That's why I knew something was up. One thing to pay attention to with fallbacks is when do you fall back? Sure, if you make that call to that third party service and it fails right away, that's great. But if it has degraded performance, if it usually took 100 milliseconds, how long are you willing to wait? If you're willing to wait five seconds, that's still a very long time in comparison to the happy path that you're gonna add latency to the overall request. So you're waiting five seconds, nothing gets returned, you fail at this point with your timeout, then you go hit your fallback, realize the latency that you're adding. That's why I find it comical when people talk about resiliency patterns like a retry, in isolation without talking about any other patterns because it can be pretty dangerous. So my example here is you're making that call, it's hitting your timeout of five seconds, but you just slapped a retry on, so you're gonna have a back off of maybe a second, then retry after a second, it's still failing because of your timeout. You could be adding a lot of latency. Just slapping on a retry using as a form of resiliency in isolation doesn't make a lot of sense. You need a little bit more context. And that context is important because maybe that call to that third party service isn't really that important. Maybe it is. Maybe you have a really low timeout because that call generally is say sub 10 milliseconds. So even with retries and backoffs, it's still acceptable the latency you're added. Plus you may be using it with something like the circuit breaker pattern. So that means that we might be using everything, fallbacks, retries, and the circuit breaker. The idea being is that if we have a failure and we can define based on different metrics of the number of failures, the number of failures within a given time of wind, like a window of time, we may just say, okay, we're just gonna use the fallback for this period of time or different metrics that you're basing it off of when you know that third party service is back up. So that if you get another request, you're not gonna go try the primary, you already know it's down or it's degraded performance, you're just gonna go hit the fallback. So it's really about the individual context and what kind of resiliency patterns you apply fallbacks, retries, and circuit breakers, and really kind of leveraging all three of them where you need to, specifically to that use case. And the thing with fallbacks that I mentioned, I said it earlier, is that you just need a good enough value. What I mean by that, as an example, let's say you have some e-commerce site where you all your base prices are in US dollars, and the customer's logged in, and they are Canadian, so you wanted to show them in Canadian dollars. So you hit some third-party service to get the current exchange rate, but it's down. What I mean is your fallback may just return you almost like a null value so that you can then show the customer not in Canadian dollars, but just kind of fall back to saying, okay, we don't really get an exchange rate because something's up. So we're just gonna show you the USD value. Sure, that's not the greatest user experience, but you're still showing them the products, the, the prices. And as a Canadian, I'm generally kind of used to seeing things in USD anyways. So I wouldn't be overly thrown off that, oh, they're behind the scenes, their exchange rate's not working right. I'd be none the wiser. Now I said by use case, you can take these resiliency patterns, pick and choose them, use all three, configure them exactly how you want per use case because that context is really important. Context is king. As the example is that where the request originates from is a part of that context. 
earlier I was showing, say a direct res request response from the client and you're adding a lot of latency directly to the client in their request. But maybe it not, it's not coming from the client, it could be from asynchronously from messaging. That means that we have our client originally make that request, rather we might be just putting a message on the queue and our request to the client, it's done, that's it. Separately, we have some worker process that's consuming that message and it's the one that needs to call that third party service. So now our latency concerns are very different in how we might configure this with retries, what those timeouts are, and whether we want to use circuit breaker or not, how the window of time of that is for that, because it's very different from when it, when it came from our client or when we're processing that and dealing with that asynchronously. Just like each third-party service, you may have a fallback for or some default value because it has a very specific use case of what it does. It's the same reason why you're not going to have just a blanket. Well, every HTTP call to anything is going to have this timeout with these retries and backoffs with this circuit breaker. It's not going to be kind of blanket. It's going to be dependent on what the third-party service is, what its performance is, how integral it is to part of your system. It is really kind of use case driven. Another important aspect is being able to handle errors from your client gracefully. So you may have some parts of your system that are degraded performance and maybe affecting kind of cascading failures everywhere. So that means that when your client makes a request to a certain part that's working totally fine, it's great, but you wanna stop immediately what's causing the fire. So that way you have different load balancing rules that I've defined here to say, okay, this part of our systems, it's degrading performance, it's starting to affect everything else and it's kind of cascading failures. We're just gonna stop it so you can't even make a request to this route because it's the one causing all the issues. Having your clients be able to handle that failure to that request gracefully can be incredibly important because then the rest of your system can still work maybe some particular routes you're defining aren't gonna work, some parts of your system will just be unavailable, but it's not taking down the entire thing. Ultimately, what I'm talking about there is bulkheads, and I'll have a link to a video that I've done at the end of this video, so you can check that out. Now, while the CrowdStrike incident didn't directly affect me, it sure did indirectly, because I knew about it right away from the alarms based on metrics. Now, all the things that we had in place for resilience definitely helped, definitely worked, but as always, when something like this happens, it makes you reevaluate certain individual contexts, everything I was mentioning about, do we have the right timeouts? Do we have the right amount of retries? Where's the request coming from? Is it from a user? Is it asynchronously processing a message? Each one of those, depending on the service, all kind of have different needs. And it makes you kind of, when an incident like this happens, makes you kind of reevaluate all the different parts of your system where you're building in that resilience. I'd love to know in the comments how you're impacted, if you're impacted, and all the fallout. Let me know in the comments, I'd love to read them. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you wanna talk with other software developers about software architecture and design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.